thank you very much. And I think tonight the time is going to be well spent because I think what we're recognizing in medicine and then in the innovations around science is nitric oxide is foundational for patient care. And there's a lot of confusion out there from companies and products. And so the purpose tonight in the next 45 or 50 minutes is kind of reveal to you the science around nitric oxide. How do we understand how to create products that actually produce nitric oxide in your patients? And so that's the title of the talk. What's the best way to enhance nitric oxide in your patients? And really the purpose tonight is not to sell you product, but to provide you quality education and science so that you as healthcare practitioners can make informed decisions on what's best for your patients and any consumers out there to be informed consumers on what products may work best for you. And so we'll get started here. These are my conflicts of interest. I've, I've been in academia for, for 20 years. I have a number of conflicts of interest. I started a number of companies, uh, basically everything revolving around the development of safe and effective nitric oxide product technologies in every major market segment around the world. So my point, again, is not to sell you product, but to provide you quality education and science real science by people who have actually done the science around nitric oxide and how you can take that information and make informed decisions on what's best for you and your patients. So my research program has been really very simple. It's answer four fundamental questions. How does the human body produce nitric oxide? What goes wrong in people that can't make it, which is a major problem, not just in the U.S., but worldwide? What are the clinical consequences? How can you recognize symptoms in certain patients that may be a sign of nitric oxide deficiency. And perhaps the most important component of this 45 minutes is how do you fix or restore endogenous nitric oxide production? What I'm going to share with you is your, your patients cannot and will not heal until you restore the production of nitric oxide. And so that's the basis of what I want to do. And I just want to put this up here. It's not to toot my own horn or to impress you, but to impress upon you that to understand nitric oxide, you have to be in the trenches. There are a lot of so-called nitric oxide experts and talking heads who have never published a single, single original paper in the nitric oxide literature. And so I spent the past 25 years doing nothing but studying nitric oxide. I've published over 200 peer-reviewed papers, abstracts, and chapters in peer-reviewed in publications. Um, in fact, at one time, I was one of the most successful inventors in the history of the University of Texas. And that's based on the annual revenue of the royalties for my product technology was responsible for 30 to 35% of the annual revenue for the University of Texas portfolio companies. So again, it's not to impress you, but to impress upon you that I've been in this field for 20 years, made a lot of similar discoveries. And so I want to share with you that tonight and hopefully change your perspective on nitric oxide, but more importantly, how to improve nitric oxide production in your patients. Because it's the credibility of your practice it's the safety and health of your patients that are relying on you and the products that you offer. The main question I get is, why have you kind of siloed yourself into a single study of focus? And why around nitric oxide? And today we know that nitric oxide is associated with an impaired production availability in many, if not most, diseases. And so we thought even 25 years ago that if we could create a fingerprint of NO biology in individual patients, and characterize NO status, then we can understand the extent of disease where we can develop rational therapies. And that's the basis of science, biomedical science, and innovations and development of new medicines. But as I'm going to show you, this mandates accurate interference free determination of nitric oxide and nitric oxide related species. But it also requires efforts to understand why, how, and when nitric oxide is metabolized to other species and which of the latter elicit biological responses in vivo. So more simply put, how do we control and dictate the metabolic state of nitric oxide? Because once you understand what nitric oxide is and does, then, then and only then can you develop rational, safe, and effective product technology. So we're going to speak very specifically about nitric oxide, but I want to start with giving you kind of a 50,000-foot view of what I've learned in academia, teaching in medical schools, teaching new physicians for future physicians and being involved in science for really my entire adult life. But chronic disease, all diseases are only caused by two things. The body's exposed to something that it doesn't need or it's missing something that it needs. But the end result of that mechanistically is there's a disruption in endogenous nitric oxide production. There's loss of regulation of blood flow, which leads to decreased circulation, hypoxia and ischemia to the affected organ which leads to increased inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. 
And those four things characterize every single chronic disease known to man. Decreased blood flow, inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. And nitric oxide addresses all four of those. And we can understand this now by looking at a lot of non-invasive imaging technology. And this is the work of Daniel Lehman, whom I'm a big fan of. He has the largest database of, of brain spec scans probably in the world. And he understands and he's taught us that the basis of neurological disease is the loss of circulation, the loss of regulation of blood flow, and the development of focal ischemia, the different regions of the brain. And what I show you here is from, from Dr. Raymond's website is the healthy brain is nicely contoured on a spec scan. It tells us that the brain is nicely perfused. Oxygen, nutrients are being delivered to every part of the brain, every tissue or every cell and, and, and part of the brain to affect neurological function. And on the right, we show, I think this is an image from a, a, a patient with chronic tra traumatic encephalopathy and chronic concussion syndrome. There's focal ischemia. The holes in the brain are reflective of decreased blood flow, hypoperfusion. And that's the basis for the neurological deficit. Yeah, so the point I'm trying to make here is that there's a disruption in the blood supply or the perfusion of any organ, then bad things happen. And in fact, this is a heart attack, but if you get to the cath lab and... and, and aspirate the thrombus, restore coronary blood flow, then we can no maintain normal cardiac function as shown here by Timmy, Timmy 3 flow. And even if you go a little bit deeper, you can see here that even neurons, motor sensory neurons are controlled by the vascularity. If you start to develop microvascular dysfunction and microvascular disease, then these neurons no longer get the blood supply they need to elicit an action potential and you develop neuropathy. So broadly speaking, every single chronic disease is characterized by decreased blood flow to the affected organ. If you can restore blood flow and perfusion, you can correct many chronic conditions. So really the holy grail in all aspects of medicine is how do you restore blood flow and perfusion to all cells in the body? And that's the role of nitric oxide. One nitrogen, one oxygen with an unpaired electron in its outer orbital, a very potent signaling molecule. And I show this because this changed the way we thought about nitric oxide in the scientific and medical community. Because nitric oxide is more than a vasodilator. It's a signaling molecule that controls protein structure and function. And the best example of this is using hemoglobin as a allosteric regulator of oxygen delivery that's solely dependent upon nitric oxide production. So when we breathe in oxygen, oxygen binds to the iron of hemoglobin. When it goes from the arteries to the veins, hemoglobin goes from an R to T transition and an allosteric transition, oxygen comes off, it picks up carbon dioxide. We exhale, we excrete carbon dioxide in the exhaled breath. And this cardiopulmonary cycle repeats itself 12 to 15 times a minute. But this does not work unless nitric oxide binds to a single cysteine residue on the beta chain of hemoglobin. Without nitric oxide production, you don't get oxygen uptake and you don't get oxygen delivery. And this is what happened during COVID. The people that got sick and, co and died from COVID were the people who could not make nitric oxide. The elderly, African-Americans, prior heart attack, diabetics, smokers, the obese. That explains the entire etiology of COVID. I'm going to show you how that works. But if you can restore the production of nitric oxide, you can improve oxygenation. You can improve oxygen uptake. You can improve oxygen delivery. And you can restore blood oxygen saturation and tissue oxygenation. It's the fundamental basis for oxygen delivery to every organ, tissue, and cell in the body. And without nitric oxide, this does not occur. But it's more than that. It, it affects every biological system. It's produced by the non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic nerve endings in the periphery, uh, controlling gut motility. It's the molecule responsible for mobilization of our own stem cells. It's a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. It's a retrograde messenger from the postsynaptic to the presynaptic cleft. Uh, it's a bronchodilator, and it's the molecule responsible for erections in men and women. And also going back to COVID, what we've learned over the past three or four years, the immune system produces nitric oxide to prevent virus from replicating and prevents bacterial from respiring. You can't make nitric oxide, virus rapidly replicates, you get sick. Without nitric oxide, you get recurrent bacterial infections because the immune system can't serve its function. And this has been the challenge for the past 30 years in, in science and medicine, and really the innovation of safe and effective nitric oxide products. Because the physical chemistry of nitric oxide is, is unlike any other molecule produced in the body. Number one, it's very potent. 
you don't need a lot of nitric oxide to elicit a biological effect. It's biologically active from one to 100 nanomolar. That's 10 to the minus nine molar concentrations. It's lipophilic, so it can readily permeate biological membranes. In fact, it's more hydrophilic than it is uh, uh, hydrophilic or lipophilic instead of hydrophilic. And although people think it's, it's re highly reactive, there's finite number of reactions with nitric oxide. There's a dioxygen reaction, which means it's second order in, in nitric oxide with reaction to oxygen. There's a radical radical reaction where it reacts with superoxide, scavenging nitric scavenging superoxide, el uh, basically eliminating the oxidative stress, binds to redox active metals, including transition metals, especially iron and heat retaining proteins. Once it's produced in the endothelial cells, the intravascular half life is less than two milliseconds. If it's produced within a cell, it can extend the half biological half life of about two seconds. So once it's produced, it's labile, it's reactive, it signals, and it goes away. So the challenge has been, how do you recapitulate endogenous nitric oxide signaling by a molecule that's produced as a gas and gone in less than a second? And I'm happy to report we've solved that riddle. So, but the point is that the older you get, the less nitric oxide you make, and that's responsible for the number one killer of men and women worldwide, which is cardiovascular disease. So as long as the endothelium is functional and can produce sufficient nitric oxide, it prevents plaque deposition, it prevents, prevents inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction, which leads to coronary artery disease and cardiovascular disease. Moreover, if you have overt cardiovascular disease, nitric oxide can actually stabilize any unstable plaque and prevent plaque rupture, which is the problem because 50% of people who die from sudden cardiac arrest have less than 50% stenosis of the coronaries. It's not the degree of stenosis, it's the instability of the plaque. Nitric oxide stabilizes the plaque, inhibits the inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction that, that causes plaque rupture. So I can't say this enough. This is work by Mark Houston. What causes arteries to age? It's inflammation, immune dysfunction, and oxidative stress. And in this particular lecture, I'm not going to have time to take you into the mechanism of all of these, but we have a clear understanding of how nitric oxide inhibits inflammation, prevents immune dysfunction, and completely inhibits oxidative stress that's associated with every age-related chronic disease. You know, there's been a lot of noise in the literature about a molecule called proxy nitrite. And this has been a ch really an annoyance to me because people making this noise don't understand simple biochemistry. Because the only way to scavenge a radical reaction is through another radical. So superoxide radical is by that a radical. The only way to stop a radical reaction is through another radical. Nitric oxide is a free radical that binds with superoxide at diffusion limit reaction rates, forms a molecule called OONO. This is a cage-like molecule that was termed proxy nitrite. But as you can see, this simply rearranges to stabilize the electrons to form inorganic nitrate which is the main molecule found in green leafy vegetables. So by virtue of NO binding to superoxide and scavenging its, its oxidative potential, it forms a protective molecule called inorganic nitrate. And there are enzymatic systems that basically take proxy nitrite through thyroidoxin glutathione peroxidase and form inorganic nitrite, which is even more potent cardioprotective, cytoprotective molecule. So any noise you hear or publications you see that Nitric oxide reacting to superoxide forms proxy nitride, leads to protein nitration, is an artifact. It's a misinterpretation of the data. And anybody who doesn't understand this do doesn't understand biochemistry. So the, the question we've tried to ask is how do we control and regulate nitric oxide production? Because once we understand how the human body makes nitric oxide and we understand what goes wrong in people that can't make it, then and only then can we develop rational therapies to restore endogenous production and actually provide a source of nitric oxide that completely recapitulates endogenous NO signaling at the rate of production and control and dictate the metabolic fate of all relevant nitric oxide metabolites. And I'm gonna take you back about 20 years because this was a fundamental discovery in vascular biology in the nitric oxide field. And this is a study we did back in 2007. We were, we were asking a very simple question. If we can enhance nitric oxide production in the heart, can we prevent the injury from heart attack? Because here's the data. There's some people who have a heart attack, they die from sudden cardiac arrest. There are a number of people who have a heart attack and they get to the cath lab, they reperfuse, 
even though they've had no flow ischemia for an hour, they survive. And moreover, sometimes they see very little injury to the heart. Post MI, an injection fraction of say 50, 55% isn't debilitating. So why do some people die from sudden cardiac arrest having a heart attack? Why do some people survive and yet still thrive despite having the same heart attack, LAD obstruction way high up, and yet the heart doesn't see any injury, in fact, performs normally? So we thought, how, if, if, if this is the case, can nitric oxide protect the heart? Can we trace this phenotype biochemically to give us some prognostic or diagnostic mediators? And so in collaboration with David Leffer's lab at the time at Albert Einstein University, then developed a cardiac specific transgenic mouse, meaning that you could overexpress the nitric oxide synthase enzyme only in cardiac myocytes. They didn't have overexpression of the nitric oxide synthase systemically, it was only in the heart. And you can see here from this paper in 2006 that there's an overexpression of the, the gene, so the, trans, the, the transfection was successful. The enzyme is active because we're detecting more nitrite, nitrate, no modified proteins in the heart. And when you subject these mice to ischemia reperfusion, they don't see hardly any injury. They're protected from injury from heart attack. And so we started interrogating these mice and go, well, what else is going on? If nitric oxide being produced in the heart, does it have distal effects in other tissue? And what we found was we collected the blood of these mice. They had elevated levels of nitrite, nitrate. We collected the liver of these mice and found that the liver biochemistry looks similar to that of the heart. But understand, nitric oxide produced in the heart with an intravascular half-life of one, two milliseconds would not survive transit to the liver. But yet the liver biochemistry looked very similar to the heart. And just to show that it, wasn't, that it was a clean transfection, there was no increased expression of the NOS enzyme in the liver. So that means that nitric oxide produced in the heart was somehow traveling to the liver, and by the way, other organs as well, systemically, modifying the, the biochemistry in these different organs. And then the question was, what does that mean anything? Does it have any physiological effect? So we occluded the blood supply to the liver for one hour, and then reperfused for five hours, collected the blood from these mice, looked at serum enzymes of ALT and AST, which are markers of liver injury. And what we found was that the liver of the mice that were overproducing nitric oxide in the heart were protected. And we published this in Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in 2008, showing for the very first time, nitric oxide is a hormone. Before this, it was only thought to be an autocrine or paracrine mediator, meaning nitric oxide could only have an effect in the organ in which it, or the cell in which it was produced or a nearby cell. Our, our paper here in 2008 completely changed the paradigm in the nitric oxide field. This was my eureka moment in science. All we had to do was generate nitric oxide gas in a single biological compartment. And what's the most accessible non-invasive biological compartment we have access to? Well, it's the mouth. If I could generate nitric oxide gas in the mouth, it would have the endocrine effects that would, that would affect the human or any organism systemically. We could increase plasma nitrite nitrate concentrations. We could change the inner biochemistry in every organ, tissue, and cell in the body and we could protect from ischemia reperfusion. We could also protect from inflammation, oxidative stress, and immune dysfunction. This was a game changer in this very similar paper in 2008. And there's no other person out there who understands this because we were the first people to publish on this. So what I want to show you is that there's two ways the body makes nitric oxide. There's an enzyme called nitric oxide synthase that converts arginine to nitric oxide. And this is a five electron oxidation reaction. And if you can't count electrons and account for the flow of electrons through a biochemical reaction or even balance a biochemical reaction, then you have no business lecturing on nitric oxide and you certainly have no business producing a nitric oxide product or selling a, a nitric oxide product because that enzymology and biochemistry is one of the most complex and complicated in the human body. That's one pathway. The second is through the diet. There's nitrate from green leafy vegetables that's converted to nitrite and nitric oxide. This is a three electron reduction reaction. Again, if you can't count electrons as a biochemistry, you have no business lecturing on nitric oxide or developing nitric oxide products. So my point here is that one can compensate for the other. We understand the enzymology and biochemistry of the NOS reaction. We certainly understand now the microbiome and its, its involvement in the two electron reduction of nitrate to nitrite and the one electron reduction of nitrite to nitric oxide. We can support both of those pathways. We can recouple the NOS enzyme 
and provide a source of nitric oxide. So let's take these one by one. Arginine utilization is controlled by the enzymatic function of the NOS enzyme and not by the availability of arginine or citrulline. There's never a condition. I'll show you one at the very end. But we're never deficient in arginine or citrulline. So it makes no sense to take a product that contains arginine or citrulline. And I'll, I'll show you the biochemistry of that. Nitrate utilization is controlled by the amount of nitrate consumed, the presence or absence of nitrate-reducing bacteria, and whether or not you can produce stomach acid production. So these are indisputable, well-defined, well-elucidated scientific biochemical mechanisms that are well understood. So nitric oxide is not considered a miracle molecule anymore. Miracles are unexplained. We explain everything we know about nitric oxide production, nitric oxide signaling, and we can control it and we can fix it. And this is the biochemical reaction here. So this is L-arginine. It's a semi-essential amino acid. The nitric oxide synthase enzyme takes this guanidine nitrogen here through a five electron multi step oxidation involving a number of different cofactors and substrates, generates nitric oxide. And as a byproduct, you get L citrulline. So people are using L citrulline thinking it's a precursor to nitric oxide. It's a byproduct of nitric oxide. You're at least eight electrons away from nitric oxide to go recycle it back to arginine, then the five electron reduction back to nitric oxide. So people who put citrulline in a, in a product just are naive and ignorant about NO biochemistry. But let's assume that the NOS enzyme is functional and coupled. And this would be a normal, healthy individual. This is a single layer of endothelial cells. This is the lumen of the blood vessel. This is the underlying smooth muscle. When we begin to exercise or give an agonist or stimulator, this turns the enzyme on. You generate nitric oxide, binds to an enzyme. First of all, NO acts as a paracrine mediator here diffuses into the smooth muscle, activates an enzyme called guanylocyclase, which is a hemoprotein. This enzyme converts GTP into cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP is the second messenger responsible for calcium mobilization, calcium-dependent smooth muscle relaxation. And that's responsible for vasodilation. Drugs like Viagra, which are called PD-5 inhibitors, inhibit the breakdown of cyclic GMP. Nitric oxide turns this switch on, Viagra keeps it on. That's why you're warned against four-hour erection and unsafe drop in blood pressure and all the side effects that are advertised with PD-5 inhibition therapy. But these drugs were approved in 1998. So 25 years on the market, billions of product, billions of dollars of products sold, and yet these drugs only work in 50% of the men in which they're prescribed. So why do people not respond to Viagra? The reason is because they can't produce enough nitric oxide here to activate this enzyme. So there's no increase in cyclic GMP. So there's no substrate for these to prevent the, these drugs to prevent the breakdown up. But this tells us that the loss of regulation of blood flow, which we call ED in the sex organs, is a symptom of nitric oxide deficiency. It's not a symptom of overactive phosphodesterase enzyme. If we can restore the production of nitric oxide, nitric oxide diffuses signals, and we can lead to vasodilation. If you look at population-based studies, this was a, public, a figure from a published a review paper I published probably in 2010, 2012. The older we get, the less nitric oxide we make through this NOS enzyme. We call this endothelial dysfunction, and that's responsible for loss of regulation of blood flow and the onset and progression of most, if not all, age-related chronic disease. But today, we know how to prevent this age-related decline in nitric oxide production. We can shift this curve to the right, or at best, completely prevent the age-related loss of nitric oxide production in the endothelium. This is the other problem. People, people don't understand the basic biochemistry and enzymology of the NOS enzyme. So the NOS enzyme is what we call a homodimer. It's two twins that come together, that there's a reductase and an oxidase domain that allows for this flow of electrons to lead to the five electron oxidation of the guanidine or nitrogen of, of arginine into nitric oxide. When this enzyme becomes uncoupled, you can feed arginine to the cows come home, but you're never going to get nitric oxide produced. You're only going to get superoxide being produced because there's a disruption in the flow of electrons and it leads to the reduction of molecular oxygen, the superoxide, and you do not get any nitric oxide being produced. In people with endothelial dysfunction, they have an uncoupled dance. So it makes no sense to give arginine, citrulline, until you can learn how to recouple the NOS enzyme. The other thing people don't understand, most lay people, is there's an electrical potential required for the extraction of an electron from a biomolecule. 
And we can quantify that through the Nernst equation. This is a very complex, this is physical chemistry at its core. And if you don't understand the electrical potential that's required to prevent oxidation of BH4 to BH2, or the electrical potential required to reduce BH2 to BH4 to prevent NOS uncoupling or to recouple and uncouple NOS, then you have no business talking about nitric oxide, lecturing about nitric oxide, developing a nitric oxide product. So to convert arginine to nitric oxide, it's the only mammalian enzyme that requires eight different cofactors and substrates. You need a coupled NOS enzyme, you need reduced tetrahydrobocrine, available glutathione, sufficient oxygen, magnesium, NADPH, FAD, and heme iron. If you can't control all of these, then again, you're never going to get nitric oxide decreased. And why is this a bad idea to give L-arginine to a patient with endothelial dysfunction? Two studies, one in 2006, they gave arginine to post-infarct patients. These are patients who had just suffered a heart attack. The patients who got the arginine group had a higher mortality, meaning that it killed more people than the placebo. They stopped this trial halfway through. Arginine should not be recommended following acute MI. Why? Because an uncoupled NOS leading to superoxide production, exacerbating the underlying condition. It's naivety that led to deaths. We can't be naive. What about in peripheral heart disease, patients who have endothelial dysfunction? You give arginine, they get worse. Intermittent claudication got worse. And the, the, uh, the conclusion was arginine is not useful in patients with intermittent claudication and PAD. Why? Because biochemically, they have an uncoupled NOS and you're producing superoxide. The other thing is you're increasing expression of arginase. You're diverting arginine away from nitric oxide production into ornithine and urea disposal. So arginine citrulline-based products are useless. Number one, you must have a functional NOS. Most endodeficient patients have an uncoupled NOS. We call this endothelial dysfunction. Arginine can activate a latent herpes virus. High-dose arginine can do more harm than good. I just showed you the two trials. And humans are never deficient in arginine. And this is the other thing people don't understand, is that in biochemistry, we have what's called a binding constant, or the Michaelis constant. And this is the concentration of arginine that's needed to theoretically saturate 50% of the binding sites to the NOS enzyme. That Michaelis constant is five micromoles. In the sickest of sickest patients, they have circulating and intracellular concentrations of arginine of 100 to 200 micromoles, meaning that even in the sickest patients, they have 20 to 40 times more arginine needed than the theoretically bind, saturate the binding site of, our, of NOS enzyme. So humans are never deficient in arginine. It makes no sense to give an arginine or citrulline-based product to enhance nitric oxide production. What about using nitrate, nitrite, nitric oxide pentyl? You must consume sufficient nitrate. There's an inherent inefficiency in nitrate reduction, only 5% reduction at the seat to nitric oxide. You must have optimal oral microbiome. Most people in the U.S., two out of three Americans use antiseptic mouthwash. Most people have poor oral hygiene. Must have sufficient stomach acid production. 200 million prescriptions written for antacids every year. That's not even counting the over-the-counter purchases. So nitrate products are typically working maybe 10, 15% of the population at best. The other problem is must have optimal salivary secretions. People have undergone prodidectomies, radiation treatment for throat cancers, uh, Sjogren's syndrome. So this pathway doesn't work in most Americans. And the data are here. To show you the, 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 the role of oral microbiome and the regulation of systemic blood flow, if you take normal intensive patients and you give them mouthwash for seven days, their blood pressure goes up. You kill the oral microbiome, you decrease nitric oxide production, you see an increase in blood pressure. And we started interrogating this about 20 years ago because it made sense to us because the human genome only codes for 23,000 gene products. The microbiome provides 3 million gene products meaning that the bacteria in and on our body do things that we as humans can't do. So our thought process was, well, let's, the gut microbiome had been fully well elucidated, but nobody focused on the oral microbiome. So we did a study in, in collaboration with the dental school at the Texas Medical Center. Let's do tongue scrapings and see, can we culture nitrate, nitrate producing bacteria that are responsible for the production of nitric oxide that may be regulating systemic blood pressure? Number one, can we culture them? Can we identify them? Can we characterize them and use them as a diagnostic or prognostic indicator and regulate systemic blood pressure? And so we published this in 2014. The more diverse the oral microbiome, the more uh, 
uh, nitrate reducing bacteria we could culture, we could characterize. These people had the best blood pressure. The least diverse oral microbiome, no detectable culturable nitrate reducing bacteria had higher blood pressure. This is an association, not causation. So next we go, let's take normal tensive patients. Let's give them chlorhexidine twice a day for seven days. Let's do daily tongue scrapings. Let's measure their blood pressure. And then four days, let's do that for seven days. Stop for four days, bring them back. Did the oral microbiome repopulate? And was there any change in blood pressure? And this is a figure from our paper in 2019. Seven days of mouthwash caused a 26 millimeter increase in systemic blood pressure in a 21-year-old dental student. We were able to detect the bacteria that disappeared when his blood pressure went up. Four days after we stopped the mouthwash, his blood pressure completely normalized, and we picked up the bacteria that re that we could pick up the bacteria that repopulated at the time his blood pressure normalized. We sequenced these bacteria. They were expressing nitrate and nitrate reductase enzymes, showing for the very first time that we could quantify and detect bacteria on the crypts of the tongue that were responsible for regulating systemic blood pressure. This explains a lot of mysteries in science and medicine, especially resistant hypertension. If you have high blood pressure, you go to your doctor, he puts it on ACE inhibitor, an ARB, a diuretic, or calcium channel and tactics. You get 50% of the people on prescription medication don't respond with better blood pressure. Why? Hypertension is a symptom of oral dysbiosis. Are you going to respond to nitrate therapy? No. Are you going to respond with arginine? No. There's only one way to correct these people, and that's to restore the oral microbiome, recouple the nitric oxide synthase, restore and digest NO production so we can get regulation of blood flow, normal vasodilation, and normalization of systemic blood pressure. The point I want to make here is nitrate is inert in humans. Capsules that contain potassium nitrate, beetroot products that are standardized to nitrate, it's inert in humans. It must be activated by oral bacteria. As I mentioned, 200 million Americans use mouthwash completely eradicating this first metabolic two electron reduction. Two million Americans use antacids, preventing the one electron reduction of nitrite to nitric oxide. And then 200 million prescriptions for antibiotics every year, completely eradicating the gut microbiome, the oral microbiome, and causing complete dysbiosis. These people are nitric oxide deficient. They're not going to get benefit from arginine or citrulline, and they're not going to get benefit from beetroot, kale, spinach, diet, or potassium nitrate capsule. And I, assume, I, I compare this to thyroid hormone because most allopathic physicians, you go and if they're hypothyroidism, they give them what? Synthroid, which is T4, which is an inactive enzyme. The reason, or enzyme, inactive hormone, the reason people are hyp have hypothyroidism is most of them, they've lost the ability to convert T4 to T3. So why give a molecule or a precursor that they can't activate into bioactive hormone? Same thing. Why give nitrate, which is inactive, when they're unable to metabolize it into nitrite and nitric oxide? Nitrate is inert in humans. So plant-based and potassium nitrate-based products will only work in less than a third, maybe less, of Americans due to simple lifestyle habits. So let's quantify this. Again, we understand every step in this pathway. How much nitrate is required? We need 300 to 400 milligrams necessary to see any change in blood pressure and improvement. And that's based on this 5% reduction efficacy. Beetroot powders, at best, contain 5 to 9% nitrate. So that means to get this 300 to 400 milligrams, you would need at least 3.5 to 6 grams of beetroot powder in a serving. You can't do this in, in capsules, and you certainly can't do this in gummies or chews. So all of these products that are sold to you in capsules, gummies, or chews are completely ineffective. Stoichiometrically, they're unable to achieve the amount necessary to generate nitric oxide. There are a number of companies out there selling activators or stimulators. These are sold in the form of grapeseed extract, resveratrol, acetylcholine, polyphenols, pomegranate, epicatechins. This requires a functional NOS system. So in most people who have endothelial dysfunction, the NOS enzyme is uncoupled, so you can activate, stimulate till the cows come home. You're never going to get any nitric oxide produced. The other problem that we have is companies selling this in gummies or chews, this sugar matrix. If I were to take a, a seed, a beet seed, for example, or a corn seed or any, any, any seed, and I'm going to plant it in a soil that's rich in nutrients, but first I put it in poison, in kerosene or glyphosate, and then I took that seed and put it in soil after it's been put in poison, do you think you're going to yield any fruit or vegetable or active plant? No. It's the same thing of putting these activators or stimulators in a sugar matrix. 
Sugar is poison. Putting grapeseed extract in a gummy or a chew, you've just basically poisoned that activator stimulator. And you've also destroyed the oral microbiome. And you've also glycated the NOS enzyme, which can lead to a decreased production of microtoxate. So gummies or chews have a major problem with this because this, complete, this has the potential to completely destroy the nitric oxide field. And the reason I'm giving this talk tonight is because this companies doing this could kill an entire industry. Nitric oxide, I know, is one of the most important molecules in science and medicine. And I hear from all the time, well, I, I understand nitric oxide may be important, but I took a nitric oxide product and it didn't do anything for me. So nitric oxide must not be that important. And the problem is, no, those, these people didn't take a nitric oxide product. They took a product from a company that was marketing as a nitric oxide product. And so when people don't take an active nitric oxide product and they don't get benefits from it, they assume and they conclude that nitric oxide is not important. And that's completely not the case. So the point here is consumers and physicians, healthcare practitioners have to understand the science so that they can communicate that to their patients. So when they give a nitric oxide product, they have science based on it. And their credibility and the safety and health of their patients is dependent upon it. So sugar destroys the oral microbiome, leading to loss of nitric oxide production. Sugar glycates the NOS enzyme, causing it to become dysfunctional. So nitric oxide cannot be delivered in a gummy or chew. And in fact, I would recommend any nutrient that's put in a gummy or chew should be completely avoided. You should not buy these products. It's a scam. And so how do we know this? Because we've tested this. How do you test nitric oxide products? Well, again, you have to understand the science of what nitric oxide is, what it becomes, what, how it's produced. So we have, we can detect this through HPLC, through ozone-based chemiluminescence. We can detect nitride and nitrate in these products. Uh, we've got a dedicated HPLC system that's sensitive to nitride and nitrate, no interference with other molecules or proteins. We can detect down the femtomolar concentrations. And we have a gas phase nitric oxide analyte that detects nitric oxide gas and its reaction with ozone. So we, we, we have these reaction chambers. We can put a product in this reaction chamber, and if it generates nitric oxide, we can detect it. I've tested every nitric oxide product on the market. I've put it through an HPLC. I've put it in an NO analyzer, and 99% of the products out there don't have any detectable nitride or nitrate. They don't produce nitric oxide because the companies making these products don't understand the basic biochemistry and enzymology, and it, it should be a crime because nitric oxide is so important and so many people are buying these products and they're not getting the benefits they deserve. The other thing we do is how do we determine if we're improving nitric oxide production in the human body? Well, there's, there's functional measurements called venous occlusion plethysmography that's been used for decades. And you basically occlude the, the inflow of the brachial artery for five minutes, you release the cuff, do an ultrasound probe or a fingertip probe, you can look at the reactive hyperemia, and then you can detect a, or, or assess a fundamental or endothelial score, endothelial reactive index. If they dilate in response to the reactive hyperemia, then that's good endothelial function. You're making lots of nitric oxide. If you release the cuff and the blood vessels don't dilate, there's no nitric oxide being produced. So we take before and afters of these. We test different products. We test our products, and we improve endothelial function. This is my test from back in, uh, what, 10 years ago, nine years ago. You see here through this vascular function test, the vascular reactive index is good, meaning my blood vessels produce sufficient nitric oxide that when we release the blood pressure cuff, blood vessels generate nitric oxide, we get reactive hyperemia, vasodilation. And we put a number of products through the test, number of patients using our products, and we improve endogenous NO production. Here's other studies we published back in 2006. You increase your cardiovascular risk factors, you decrease your nitric oxide production in stepwise <clears throat> manner. What about salivary testing? You know, I developed the first and only salivary test back in 2010. Now there are a number of companies selling this. I think it's a good tool to have in your toolbox, but I don't use this anymore because there's no, there's no such thing as a false negative. If you're negative, you're negative, but it doesn't tell us why you're negative. But there's too many false positives from active oral infections. We're finding out there's so many people have active either symptomatic or asymptomatic oral infections that lead to a false positive. The best example is a 50-year-old overweight diabetic, uh, hypertensive patient with erectile dysfunction. You give him the salivary test, he lights it up. Obviously, this guy isn't replete in nitric oxide. We found out he had an active oral infection. So this gives people a false sense of security with the false positives. So we don't rely on salivary testing anymore. We really rely on the symptoms. And that's the beauty of the patient 
physician interaction so you can look at the whole clinical picture, start to assign symptoms of nitric oxide deficiency. How do you improve nitric oxide in patients, restore blood flow? Uh, our, whole phenom- our whole process of doing this was, number one, if your body can't produce nitric oxide, we must do it for you. And because of our 2008 paper showing nitric oxide is a hormone, it's the same principles that apply to hormone replacement therapy. If your body can't make testosterone, what do you do? You take testosterone. And women who are estrogen deficient, what do you do? You give them estrogen. You don't give them precursors because they've lost the ability to metabolize that into these hormones. Same thing with nitric oxide. You can't give them precursors. The reason they're nitric oxide deficient is because they've lost the ability to convert it. You have to give them active hormone, active nitric oxide. And we do this through a nitric oxide lozenge. It's the, we're the only people, I'm the only person in the world who's ever developed a solid dose form of nitric oxide gas. It's the only technology in the world that anxiety a source of NO, recouples the NOS enzyme, improves the oral microbiome. We do this in a fermented beet powder where we take out the oxalates, pre-convert it so we're not dependent upon the oral bacteria. We produce NO gas once it's dissolved in solution. And also it's not dependent upon stomach acid production. These products work in every single patient that we deliver it to because we control and dictate the metabolic fate of nitric oxide and we're not dependent upon the individual patient's capacity to produce nitric oxide. And then we developed a topical dual chamber for skin care. These are nitric oxide, a, a small list of the nitric oxide products that, that I've developed. Lozenge, topical serum, the fermented beet powder. Your body can't make nitric oxide. We do it for you. More importantly, we fix the reason your body can't make it. What nitric oxide is not, it's not a bunch of ingredients thrown in a bag and called nitric oxide. It's not gummies. It's not NO explode. It's not all these products that are sold as a nitric oxide product. And look, these products are sold by a lot of good companies who sell really good products, but they don't understand nitric oxide to the extent that they can rationally develop a nitric oxide product. The Cardio Miracle product has 55 ingredients in it. These are 55 good ingredients, but this doesn't make it a nitric oxide product. This is a former insurance salesman who throws in ingredients together and calls it a miracle. This product is actually a miracle because it would be a miracle if it actually produced nitric oxide. And this is another list of products that are in by good companies, but they just don't understand the extent of nitric oxide deficiency where they can put ingredients together and actually fix the reason your body can't make nitric oxide. So again, nitric oxide is critically important, but it's more important that physicians, healthcare practitioners, and consumers and patients understand the science so they can make informed decisions. So let me just wrap up here in the next five or 10 minutes. Beets do not equal nitrate. Most of the beets on the market have no detectable nitrite or nitrate. Nitrate does not equal nitric oxide. Arginine citrulline products do not work in patients with fetal dysfunction. What to look for? Does the product actually produce nitric oxide? Is there published clinical trials on the product? Has the inventor formulated ever published original research on immunobiochemistry, enzymology? Just do a PubMed search. But don't be fooled by creative marketing, science and experience manager, matter. I'll take you through. This is how we demonstrate we generate nitric oxide. We put the lozenge in the mouth. We detect nitric oxide coming out. It's vasoactive. Do an ultrasound. We can look at the carotid artery. Ten minutes after the lozenge has been placed in the mouth, we see a 13% increase in vessel diameter, 34% increase in blood flow. I'm going to show you the best example of complete nitric oxide deficiency in humans. And it's an inborn air metabolism called arginosuccinic acid urea. There's a group of patients that are born without an arginosuccinate lyase enzyme. Uh, if you remember back from your biochemistry course, that this is the partial urea cycle that's found in every cell in the body. And this partial urea cycle converts arginine to citrulline to uh, arginosuccinate synthase. And when nitric oxide is being produced, you get, arg- you get citrulline as a byproduct, arginosuccinate synthase, arginosuccinate lyase, convert it back to nitric oxide. And these patients develop hyperammonemia because it's a urea cycle disorder, but they develop systemic disease that couldn't be explained by their underlying inborn air metabolism, liver disease, neurological disease, blood clotting disorders, resistant hypertension, kidney disease. These kids have systemic disease that could not be explained by their inborn air metabolism. And we published this in Nature Medicine in 2011, showing that the ASL enzyme is what tethers the NOS enzyme to the membrane. So in these patients that can't make in, they don't have an ASL enzyme, this protein complex falls apart, these kids are given 25 to 30 grams of arginine per day because they can't make it it's a semi-essential amino acid. But yet they don't get any nitric oxide produced from it. Why? It's not because they're 
it's because this protein complex falls apart and they can't shuttle this semi-essential amino acid through the NOS pathway. So once we understand this, then these patients are completely devoid of nitric oxide. Well, you can't give them more arginine because they can't convert it. We don't know anything about their oral microbiome, but a lot of these kids have severe oral dysbiosis. And so probably they can't make nitric oxide through that pathway. And they have dietary restrictions, protein restrictions. So very restricted diet. So we had one single patient that we published this in 2012 in the American Journal of Human Genetics. His lifelong blood pressure profile at five years of age to 15, severe hypertensive, uncontrolled resistant hypertensive, despite being on three different um, antihypertensive medications. In February of 2010, he came to Texas Children's Hospital in the pediatric intensive care unit, blood pressure of 210 over 115. We understood that it was a nitric oxide problem and started dosing him with the uh, isosorbide, which is an organic nitrate, not inorganic nitrate, organic nitrate, like nitroglycerin, isosorbide dinitrate. These, these drugs are metabolized in the nitric oxide, normalized his blood pressure, did quite well for a year. And then in February of 2011, he came back to Texas Children's. Blood pressure was 200 over I think, 110 when we saw him. He was taking 20 milligrams isosorbide dinitrate four times a day, and his blood pressure wasn't controlled. We developed a specifically orally disintegrating tablet that released nitric oxide for this kid. These rare kids and very special. This isn't a commercial product at the time. And within four hours, his blood pressure completely normalized. And we followed him for 12 months. We published this. to got him off all prescription medication and normalized his blood pressure with an orally disintegrating nitric oxide generating lozenge when all pharmaceutical products had completely failed this therapy. His kidney disease resolved in five days. His heart disease resolved within five months. So in a very complex inborn air metabolism, a genetic disorder, completely rescued this kid by giving an oral nitric oxide releasing lozenge. We overcame a genetic phenotype, and completely rescued the phenotype with the nitric oxide being delivered in the early disintegrating tablet. Never been done in the history of medicine. We published this in the American Journal of Human Genetics in 2012 and save this kid's life when all of the therapies have filled up. I'll take you very quickly through other kind of non-invasive um, diagnostics. You can look at microvascular. This is non-ischemic ethnosography looking at the stiffness, the structure of the blood vessels. You want type 1 or type 2 blood vessels. <clears throat> we took a 74-year-old female, type 5 blood vessels, gave her an orally disintegrating tablet for 90 days, converted her to type 1. 70-year-old female, type 4 to type 2 for 60 days. A 60-year-old male type 4 to type 2 in 60 days. So showing that we can completely change the structure and function of blood vessels and their risk, cardiovascular risk, simply by giving nitric oxide. We developed a dual chamber nitric oxide serum for skin care, for topical. The skin is an organ just like the heart or the sex organs. If it doesn't get enough blood supply, it fails. Well, you don't develop erectile dysfunction or coronary disease, but you develop fine lines and wrinkles, you lose hydration, and you look old. So this dual chamber nitric oxide delivery. Topical, applied twice for 30 days. I'll go very quickly through this. These are five peer-reviewed published clinical trials. Uh, age spots disappear, fine lines and wrinkles, inflammation on the neck goes away, broken blood vessels improve, the varicosity improves, tone texture clarity improves. Amazing effects on wound healing. This lady had a facelift, developed a full thickness ulcer. Apparently, she was smoking and applying pressure here. Uh, topical nitric oxide, complete closure in 10 days. Polycystic, uh, uh, polycystic acne, uh, this poor lady unresolved for previous two years on all types of medication, 30 days completely resolved the polycystic acne. 15-year-old um, teenage acne scar, 30 days completely remodeled, almost complete uh, resolution of 15-year-old scar. What about spike protein and long COVID? I'll wrap this up real quickly. Uh, this explains everything we know about COVID. Spike proteins is pop toxic. Leads to an upregulation of H receptors, it binds monocytes, neutrophils, stick to the lining of the blood vessel, activate platelets, platelets become degraded, elevation in D dimers, microclots, heart attack, stroke, uh, myocarditis. Everything we know about COVID, long COVID, can be related to a loss of nitric oxide. Nitric oxide can actually prevent vascular inflammation. Real time intravital microscopy this is a paper we published in 2009. We can induce vascular inflammation, increase the expression of adhesion molecules. Monocytes and neutrophils stick. Uh, everything bad happens is the early stage of cardiovascular disease. 
We give that same vascular inflammation, but we provide nitric oxide. We downregulate the adhesion molecules. Monocytes and neutrophils don't stick. They don't migrate, completely inhibiting vascular inflammation. We've now taken this into FDA drug studies. We have a drug in phase three clinical trials for COVID. Over 650 very sick patients treated, not a single adverse event reported. Uh, patients got better, improved blood oxygen saturation by 14%. Patients on the treated group had one day less duration of COVID symptoms. Uh, now we're developing our topical into a, an FDA drug for diabetic non-healing ulcers. It's antimicrobial. Very quickly going through diabetic foot ulcers, non-healing for three years. We healed it in 30 days. Uh, second degree burn, uh, 21 days of the serum, complete healing, no scar formation. 64-year-old wheelchair-bound paraplegic, non-healing ulcer for four years. We simply applied the, the serum three times a day, completely healed in 195 days. So to get to the kind of the answer, the question of the, the title of the webinar was how do you restore nitric oxide in your patients? Well, stop doing the things that disrupt it. Start doing the things that promote it. If your patients are on mouthwash, you have to stop. Get rid of fluoride. Get rid of fluoride in your toothpaste. Get rid of fluoride in your drinking water, the water you bathe in and cook in. You have to get a home filtration system. If you're using antacids, you got to stop. People who have been on PPIs for three to five years have 40% higher incidence of heart attack, stroke, and Alzheimer's. You got to get patients off antacids. Stop eating high carbohydrates. Don't take gummies or chews, and just then start doing the things that promote it. Balanced diet in moderation. Moderate physical exercise. 20, 30 minutes of, of sunlight, or I'm a big fan of infrared light therapy. And then when all else fails, we have products. We and only we have products that deliver nitric oxide and restore the body's ability to make it. So nitric oxide controls and regulates blood flow and oxygen delivery to every cell in the body. There's an age-related decline that asserts its effect on cardiovascular risk. And we must use safe and effective nitric oxide product technology to optimize our health, the health of our patients. And your body cannot and will not heal without nitric oxide. The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. Ignorance is curable. And I think that's why it's important. And I want to thank A4M for the opportunity to provide education. Ignorance is the lack of information or education. So we can cure ignorance. But the problem is the greatest enemy is the illusion of knowledge. And there are companies out there that have an illusion of knowledge who are actively deceiving and defrauding their customers and falsely advertising the nitric oxide products when biochemically, enzymatic, enzymatically, and scientifically, there's no way these products can generate nitric oxide. We have to maintain some integrity in the nitric oxide science. Been doing this for 25 years, and I encourage other companies to learn, improve, and start putting products out there that are based on science, and not throwing a bunch of ingredients together and call it a nitric oxide product, because it can, can kill an entire industry and do a complete disservice to your patients. And this is a paper I published in 2004, almost 20 years ago, understanding that if you don't know what you're doing with nitric oxide, you can't dictate and control the metabolic fate of NO, there's a lot of biochemistry that you don't want to happen here. You don't want to produce nitrosating agents. You don't want to form nitrosamines that cause cancer and mutagenic. If you don't know what you're doing, you can cause more harm than good. So trust the science, or importantly, trust those that actually do the science. There are a lot of talking heads out there who have no idea about the basic biochemistry and enzymology about nitric oxide. Don't be fooled by creative marketing, deceptive advertising. Turn your TV off. Put ingredients in a bag or a capsule. It does not make it a nitric oxide product. So with that, I will stop here. We will take time to answer questions. I want to be respectful for your time. Uh, there's my book. There's my uh, educational website. For those of you who want to get educational nitric oxide, I'm not trying to sell you anything. You can follow me on social media. For practitioners who want information on, on wholesale pricing on the product, you can email Susan Schaefer, Susan at N101. And for those of you that want uh, information directly on the product, then there's our product website. So with that, again, I can't thank you enough for spending your Tuesday night with me at 7 o'clock. I know how important it is, especially the week of Thanksgiving. We're spending time with, with family and friends. And again, in this week of Thanksgiving, I can't thank you enough. And I'm extremely grateful for sharing your time with me tonight. So if you have any questions, let's put it in the Q&A. Um, and I've got three questions here. What's your opinion on tapping mouth for nasal breathing to support nitric oxide? Oh, taping mouth. Yeah, look, the, the highest concentration of NOS enzyme is in the, the, the airway epithelium. But the problem is if you have endothelial dysfunction and the NOS enzyme is uncoupled in the endothelium, it's uncoupled in the epithelium. So if you do nasal breathing and you have an uncoupled NOS, it's not going to produce.
produce any nitric oxide. We have to focus on recoupling the NOS enzyme. Now, when you do deep breathing or nasal breathing, the enzyme is coupled. You can actually generate nitric oxide through activation of the mechanoreceptors. But in most people that have endothelial dysfunction, they have epithelial dysfunction, and they get no nitric oxide from nasal breathing. That so we have to recouple it. And we, we've detected this through our nitric oxide analysts. Uh, does mouthwash that is designed to remineralize teeth and balance pH kill the nitrate reducing back uh, microbes? The ingredients are nano silver, calcium, xylitol, water, and flavor. The shorter answer is I don't know. You know, we've only tested a number of different <clears throat> mouthwashes, those that are designed to be antiseptic. So when you see the commercials that says Listerine and Scope kill 99.99% of the bacteria in your mouth, believe them. They do. And that's not a good thing. Uh, so antiseptic mouthwash indiscriminately kills all bacteria. What we're trying to do is work with the dental community to selectively target the opportunistic pathogens that are causing caries, periodontal disease, gingivitis, kill those while, ma while maintaining the integrity of the commensal non-pathogenic bacteria. And in fact, we've got some really exciting initiatives going on with the dental community now where we're going we're to change the landscape of dental medicine. And we're going to start targeting the, or the commensal bacteria, increasing the diversity of the oral microbiome, thereby keeping the bad guys at bay. So rather than using antiseptics, we're going to use prebiotics and probiotics to let the good guys take care of the bad guys. So stay tuned. Uh, are your medications available to prescribe? No, I think that's a very good reminder. So everything I've presented tonight, although I've got a drug company called Brian Therapeutics involved in FDA drugs, uh, the products that I'm sharing with you tonight, the N101, are consumer products, dietary supplements, and skincare products not intended to treat, prevent, or cure, or diagnose any disease. So these are intended to support the normal structure and function of the human body. We don't make any disease claims. So these are available directly to consumer through healthcare practitioners. Uh, we've got our drugs in phase three clinical trials. I anticipate that we'll have drugs approved by the FDA on the market, hopefully by the end of next year, where where licensed healthcare practitioners can prescribe it then to their patients if they find it within their best medical uh, information to prescribe it. Uh, please share in our product dosage and schedule should it be used all the time. Um, so yeah, so I developed the lozenge to completely recapitulate nitric oxide based signaling. So we know how much nitric oxide a healthy person makes in 24 hours and we give that back. But it's impossible to ascribe a one size fits all. The metabolic demands that what I need are completely different than somebody with hypertension, ED, and diabetes. So we have to use our best medical judgment on how to dose for any given patient. But here's what we've learned from, from randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials, including our drug study in COVID. One lozenge twice a day is typically sufficient. The one kid, the ASA patient, we were dosing him one lozenge every four hours. He was taking five lozenges a day. But that's in probably the worst uh, phenotype of nitric oxide deficiency. Most people don't need that. But one lozenge twice a day, 12 hours apart is a good place to start. Monitor your patients. You may need less or more. But for me, I, I'll be 50 next week. I don't have any health-related issues. And I take one, sometimes maybe two lozenges a day. And I do this prophylactically because I don't want to wait until I get high blood pressure ED to start taking the lozenge. I want to prevent the age-related decline so I don't develop ED and I don't develop high blood pressure or diabetes. So we have to use this prophylactically. And I think that's the, the beauty of supplements is we have to understand what our body's deficient in and target it and supplement things that are missing. Uh, will an oral probiotic be available to restore? Yeah, we're working on that. Stay tuned. Um, so... Um, yeah, any other questions or questions related to products uh, specific? But Ali, again, my job is not to sell you product. My, my job is to provide product differentiation and the science around nitric oxide so you can make informed decisions. And again, the reason I do this is to preserve the integrity of the nitric oxide field because the worst thing we can do is give patients a product that's labeled as nitric oxide that really isn't a nitric oxide product and they don't get a benefit from it then they could, their conclusion is nitric oxide is not important. It didn't work for them. And that's not the message we want to send. Nitric oxide is the most potent, is the most important molecule that we can restore in the human body. And the science tells us that your body cannot and will not heal without nitric oxide. And we must use safe and effective strategies and technologies to restore it. So with that, again, I think we're right at three minutes over. Um, you have my email. If I didn't answer any questions tonight, 
uh, please send me an email. I think A4M is going to record this and have access to it on the, in their uh, in their portal. Uh, I'll be speaking at A4M in December. I encourage everybody to attend the longevity event. It's the one of the, it's my favorite show of the year. It's the most advanced, innovative medical training uh, in the United States. In fact, in the world. So I'm a big fan of A4M. I can't thank them enough for their support. Uh, we certainly support everything they do and the, the information they give. So with that I'll bid you good night. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, God bless you all. Thank you, Dr. Brian. And thank you, everyone, for uh, spending your time with us. And we'll see you in Vegas.